when did you start drawing? I was a kid. I, was, I think seven, eight years old, I started to draw. And my father looked at the drawings and said, you're copying these things. Where are you getting them from? <laughs> and I didn't. He never believed me. He never quite believed me. And I, from there, just progressed onward. Do you have any formal training? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I studied at the Museum of uh, Brooklyn Art, the School of Industrial Art. I went also the Art Students League. About 15 years I studied. You know. It was quite a bit. And then later on, I went to the school I'm teaching at now, the School of Visual Arts. I studied there about three years. So I had quite a few years in. Who were the biggest influences from the Forster, Kniff to a degree. Meskin and Jack Kirby, both Ed Cartier. He was a big influence. I loved his work. Did you follow the Popes? Oh, sure. I used to read The Shadow constantly. Doc Savage, The Shadow. And then Ed Cronin put me on to, as someone said, Morn, and so on and so forth. Yeah. When did you sell your first professional piece? The first one I did was rejected after I completely did it. I walked in, I felt so happy. It was a place called Fox Comics, a tiny outfit many years ago. I think I was 16 at the time. And I brought it in, and I was looking forward to my check, and the guy said, I can't accept this, it's not professional. And he turned it away. The next job, then I got more determined. And the next job I took it, I did it. I think it was about 17 and a half I sold my first job. And what year was that? 43, 44? About that, just about that, yes. Yeah, just about. So how long did you work for Fox? Oh, I worked for them, I did one job, and that was it. But then he wanted for, for more, I said, no way, that's it. I got even. Did you find out from the rest of the business that he was the cheapest guy in the business? Well, nobody else would hire me, so it was the only place I could go. So that's the only reason I worked there. I went around and made the rounds. Then I worked for Timely Comics, Joe Simon over there. He was the editor in those days. And at Timely Comics is not Marvel Comics today. And I got a little work on him, some inking, some penciling, not very much. And then they asked me to work on staff. And my father said, no way, you're finishing school. So I took care of that. And a year or so later, Al Cap got in touch with me. He wanted me to come work for him in Boston. And again, my father said, no way. I didn't think it was going to be a cartoonist after all this went on. But I kept going. It was all right. Well, it's a good way to make money, considering, in fact, you were still in school. Yeah, but he wouldn't let me. But you, you made money while you were still a teenager. Yeah, I was making some money. Yeah, I was making money. But I wanted to go full blast then, you know? I wanted to get out of school. I wanted the works, you know? And then he said, nah, you're finishing school. So, and in those days, you got to remember, if you finished high school, that was it. That was big stuff. To go to college is out of the question, you know. So once you got out of high school, did you end up going full full blast? I began, yeah. I worked for a number of smaller companies. I worked for a place called Hillman Comics, a man, Ed Cronin, over there. I worked with him. And before that, though, there was a wonderful guy on 23rd Street. He had a, they called it a factory where they had artists sitting there drawing day and night. Chesler? Harry Chesler. And Harry would give me five bucks just to come in, sit there, watch people draw, go back and forth, and eat every day, which is very nice. Now, a lot of people hated him, but he was awfully good to me. I could never say a word about him. He treated younger artists, newer artists who were getting in the business right. better than the guys who been Yeah, the, the other guys, oh boy, he, he was rough. And it's, he was a character, he sat with his little derby at the desk, and there's a rickety elevator that goes all the way upstairs, his fourth floor, and you got out and he's facing you in his old desk and puffing on a cigar, and he had a Milton Kniff drawing in back of him. That was his standard. And the other room was like a prison where all the others were sitting. It was interesting. But I learned, and I learned that was important. When you were at Chesler, did you end up learning composition or no, layout from any of the guys? No, I went to, to the... Uh, the Art Students League, there was a teacher there named Jim McNulty, an elderly guy, but brilliant. He's the one that taught me composition and design, just tremendous man. That's where I got most of it from. From there I went to Hillman Comics, that was Ed Cronin, he was a great teacher. He's the one that made me study writing, he kept pounding on me, and he made me write some stuff for him. I wrote things like The Heap, Air Boy, a couple of crime stories for him. And then he put me on to uh, Somerset Morn and the Maupassant, et cetera, et cetera. So I began picking up my writing skills there, right at an early age. This is, I was about 17 at the time. And where'd you learn story flow? Uh, that's just adaption, just doing and doing and doing. That's how you got it. I was working for DC for a while, and then I got a call from Simon and Kirby. Would I come work for them? I knew they were cheap, these two guys, you know. But working with Kirby was worth it. So I went down there. I didn't quit the job at DC. I did that stuff at night. And I went there to work with Jack. I wanted to be with Jack. And I learned a hell of a lot from him. I'll never forget that. 
fast guy. Tremendous, just tremendous. And we got to be good friends over the years. And what did you do at DC? What kind of, what kind of stories? Were when you? I began there, I think I started on a thing called Johnny Quick or something or other. This was a whole transition period when Sheldon Mayer had taken over and he was moving the older guys out and moved people like myself, Cubit, and Alex Toth were coming in at that time. And what was it like to work with someone like Shelly? Do you remember? I loved him. I loved him. He was sitting there in his desk. Frank Giacoy, he's gone now. He's dead. We went to his office, very impressed with him. We're sitting there. All of a sudden, the door opens behind us, and little Hazen comes in with a T-square, leaps on the desk. Shelly grabs a T-square, and they start dueling all around the room. And Frank and I look at each other. What the hell is going on? It's supposed to be a business. And then they touch swords, they kiss each other, and he walks out. And Hazen walked out. And that was our initiation in National Comics. You must have thought I was crazy. And they were crazy. They're both crazy. Uh, Shelley was really mad, though. Didn't have, but he was a cartoonist. He really yeah, was. and he was a terrific one. He taught us tremendously. He was great. He was tough to work with. He was a tough cookie. But you learned with him. I brought in a job once I did, really didn't take my time with. And he did it beautifully. He looked at it. He looked at me, and he says, Do you want me to accept this? I said, well, he said, You want me to accept it? I'll accept it. But do you really want me to accept? I took it home and redid it. <laughs> you know how to handle it. <laughs> did you know Toth and Kubert? And sure, we grew up Kane together. Was, uh, Gil Kane came in later, mm. but Joe Kubert and Alex and I grew up together. Joe had a studio in Manhattan. We always used to congregate over there. We'd hang around. We stayed all hours, sometimes two, three in the morning. It was fun. We had good times there. You guys were the young Turks in those Yeah, days. yeah, that's right. Three of us. But Gil came in much later, though, much later. Alex, I mean, I was talking this with Erwin, and he said that Alex, because of his domineering mother and the fact that they had you know, a tough family life, really kind of latched on to Erwin and thought of him as like... He a, did. A he did, yeah. It's true. He hung on Erwin. He did, yeah. He really loved his work, too, because it was nice, simple, bold. Yeah, and Erwin's work is very much like Frank Robbins, and Alex was at that time an amateur Frank Robbins, and then he went from Robbins to... Old Sickles, and then of course at the end was Captain Easy. Roy uh, Crane. Roy Crane. It was the best of the lot. But Alex is a, the cream. In my opinion, Alex and the guy named Nick Cardi are the best in the business. You were working for DC um, at night, and you were working for Simon Joe Kirby and during Joe the day. And, yeah. yeah. I did it for about two years. I couldn't do it anymore. It was too much, you know, because I had no social life, I had no life. And finally, I left Joe and uh, Jack went back to DC. That's a lot. How many pages did you pencil in those days? I would do two during the day and two at night. So I think I had four hours sleep a day. And it was pretty rough. And how much inking did you do on your own stuff? Uh, at the beginning, very little. Then later on, I did a little more. But DC never liked my inking. So they wouldn't let me do it. But then I threatened to quit once in a while, and they'd give me a job to do here and there. They appeased me. So who are your main inkers? Bernie Sachs? Bernie Sachs was one, Joe Giella was another, of course Murphy was the other one, and Frank Giacoya. Frank, I think, was the best of the lot. We traveled together, he and I. We went to school, I met him in school, they worked the time we liked, the comics together, and then we went to D.C. together, and Shelley hired us both. But Frank kind of drifted on later, he went back to Marvel when Stan was operating it, so I didn't see him anymore. Did a lot of Jack's work. Yeah, he was brilliant, others are the best of the lot. You had a, a real sense of immediacy to your work and, right. and a lot of motion in it. Did you ever learn anything from any of the inking? Good or bad or indifferent? From the inkers? Yeah. How about your own work? When I inked it myself, I didn't need as much penciling, you know, and, and no one does, which is obvious. But uh, I enjoyed the other more, actually, the penciling. But then every once in a while I needed a kick and I would get it. You know, and I'd do some inking, not very much. I think I did a, maybe a dozen stories for DC the most. Well, I know you did two regular features that you inked yourself. You did Elongated Man in right. Space Museum. And I did the other one, Detective Chimp. That was probably my favorite. I, obviously, things started changing in the 50s. All of the superheroes were kind of... They were big, gone. They were yeah. gone at that time. What we're doing, this guy Kefauver would come in. He was running for president. And he needed a cause. And we were the cause. Because he picked on comics, the crime, the violence, the this, the that. So, comics got hit hard because of uh, Bill Gaines' books. They threw his oldest books off the stand. He couldn't even make a living with those things. And we were doing westerns, romance, science fiction, anything, anything to just keep going. We even had to take page cuts. They called us all in, and they said, it was Alex, myself, and Joe, and 
you won't exist, we're gonna have to give you page cuts. We have no choice, you accept it, you know. Did you like the variety of the, of the different stories you did? Yeah. Did it make any difference? I didn't care, I just wanted to keep working, you know. It was rough times in those days, you know. But did the variety give you a broader sense of, of subject in terms of being able to draw different subjects? Yeah, that was the important part. That was important. Shelley used to push that on us constantly. He said, it's very important, do everything, learn to do everything, you know, which we did, you know. And it was worthwhile, it paid off, I think. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, uh, different subjects require different emotional values. Right, right. And, uh, we had, and we were fans of films, you know, Joe, Alex, even Irwin. And we'd go, Hitchcock, a big favorite, I loved his stuff. Carol Reed. Carol Reed, I love Reed's work. I Third love that. Yeah, Third Man was incredible. How much of this stuff in terms of pacing, in terms of how you lay out a panel, uh, relates a lot to film? Hitchcock. Yeah. I saw Hitchcock. I used to take his films. I rent them at, at times. And now it's even easier. But in those days, I go sit in the movie house four or five hours all day long. I sit through a film four or five times. And I have it paired with me. And the flashlight. People thought it was nuts. But I thought he was genius for this stuff. He was the simplest, clearest. You know? well, he always worked from storyboards. Yeah. He storyboarded everything. In fact, I heard he storyboarded the whole film. And once he approved that, he never looked in the camera once which was a classic way to work. Watching the movies, did you break down the story different than, say, someone else would in terms of the way you would put it together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I looked for the flashpoints on how a, a director would handle the thing. When they brought the character in, like with Weston, where the guy's coming in, you see how Ford would do it. I'd watch him, and then George Stevens. You remember the wonderful Jane? Jane. Giant. Yeah, and I said, my God almighty. These, but they all broke down very simply. They were very direct and to the point. And that's where I try to work. So did that was go, a big influence for me. So did you go to the movies with Alex every once in a while? Alex and Frank Giacoya, who we were constantly in the movie house. He would get make his mother make these big hero sandwiches, and we'd go sit in the movie house all day long. We'd go at 12 o'clock. He only paid a dime in those days for a film, you know. So he went and sat there all day long. And so you guys were all night people, weren't always. you? Always. You had to be. You had to be. And then we'd go home and study and go on the phone with each other about what we saw. You know? But I would make sketches in the theater, you know, and watch the way they would break down the film. What'd you do with all that stuff? Gone. <laughs> Everything's gone. So Even the comics are gone that I had. I haven't saved one comic book. So all those were kind of formative years in terms of developing all right. your, your, your style and yes. your talent. You got to the point, let's say, in the mid-50s where, where you really knew what you wanted to do and you could get it done and you had, you had the practice and the... Were there any challenges left for you at that point? Yeah, Dave. At one point, uh, I was drawing pretty... Uh, my style was not the way it was toward the end. It was very realistic, and it was bothering me. There was I just didn't have enough there. And I went back, and I studied again with the School of Visual Arts. I took this guy, and he was strictly a designer. So he really broke me down. It took me, oh my God, about a year and a half. My work was getting awful at DC. They were complaining, they didn't know what that was going on. But they wrote it out with me, you know. And then I made the transition from that to the style I had until the end. It paid off, because it was my own then. I was comfortable with that. The other I wasn't comfortable with. I used to pick up your original pages from the Flash and some of the Mystery in Space pages. I noticed you do a lot of sketching before you started. Yeah, on the back. Yeah. It was like a ball play warming up. You know? How did you do? What did you do? I work at home. And I'd start about 11, 12 o'clock, and I'd sit there, turn the page over, and put two to three hours in, just sketching, just drawing whatever I felt like. Houses, people, whatever I thought came. And then when I felt that my hand was flexible enough, I'd turn it over and then do my page. i do two a day. So the day would end about two or three in the morning. So it was a long day, you know. Were there any specific influences from, say, architecture, either like Frank Lloyd Wright? He was the favorite. I, loved him. I wanted to be an architect, but... We couldn't afford to go to college and go on with that. So I pushed it into the, the comics. You know. I noticed a lot of futuristic cities were based <laughs> on Lloyd Wright. Oh, time. absolutely. He was a strong influence. Did you ever follow any kind of futurists, like Paolo Soleri or any of those? Yes, yes. I like Soleri very much. Yeah, he did that great city out in Arizona. Arkansas? Yeah. I remember picking up his book Incredible. with all of the design right. sketches for his future city. Yeah, what also shocked me was Corbusier in Af North Africa, his buildings in North Africa, you know. You think of North Africa as a sullen, dull place, and you see these magnificent structures. It's like, where the hell are these coming from? You so know? did you have a big swipe file? I did, I did. On buildings, costumes, you had to have in those days, because you had to do everything. We didn't have time to go to the library back and forth, back and forth, so it was much easier that way. 
Yeah, you didn't have any favorite stories that you ended up doing. I mean, in, in terms of characters, right? No, no. I didn't like the superheroes. That was a hell of a thing to admit, but I didn't like doing them. Why? Uh, they were a little flamboyant for me, you know? I liked the mystery stuff. The thing I did called The Phantom Stranger. And I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the detective chimp. It was very light and airy, you know. Strange sports. Strange sports. I got a kick out of that one. Yeah, that was tough one to handle. That one, I know when I went in, Julie said to me, we want this book to look different. Now do something different. That's the way he threw things at me. So what I did, I used the captions to begin an action and the picture to end an action. If you look at them carefully, you see the baseball player's arms go back and the caption in silhouette. And then the actual picture, you see the arms follow through. You used to do like doing little vignettes. Yeah either with hands or with faces, hmm. as introduction or exit pieces, devices to get readers to go to other places. Where'd that come from? I remember reading comics as a kid, and the big synop at the beginning, I would never read. And that's where it started. If I, if I didn't read it, they're not reading mine either. So what I did, I developed these areas. Number one, I used the little hands pointing all over the place. I used heads, little cities, whatever, just to bring the reader in. Once you got them in, then you got them hooked. That was the whole idea. Did any of the writers ever come to you and say, you know, I never thought about the fact that no, no. one reads my text? No, not a word, never. What did someone like your editor say? Julie probably didn't. Julie never said anything. If I ever asked him, what do you think of the job? He said, you got paid, didn't you? That was his reaction, period. <laughs> I would create covers, and he'd write stories around them. That's how this whole thing began with covers for me. Obviously, covers are the thing that sell the book. And a lot of times, you realize that a cover has to have a good, strong idea behind it that is simple, that, that a reader can get like that, so he can be drawn It's an impulse it. buy. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, you ended up doing a huge amount of covers along with, you know, and it was only a handful of people that did the covers. Right. Did you think about that in terms of your value to the company, number one, the fact that you got the opportunity to do it. Well, at the beginning, I just needed the work because Julie would uh, say, give me a cover, I'll get a story written for you. So if I didn't do it, I didn't get any work. So I just kept doing covers after cover after cover. But then I got more to do. i get them from Murray, i get them from Schiff, and something knew something was going on. Why did they just give me covers, you know? What happened was, I was the Batman craze was on, you know, with the uh, TV show and with all the licensing artwork I was doing. And I'd get maybe 50 bucks or 100 bucks for a drawing. They'd use it all over the place. Hey, I said, what's going on here? So they tried to pacify him, give me a couple of bucks here and there. I said, the hell with this. I called up Lee. And he said, sure, come on over. I'll give you 5,000 more you're making now. We heard about it. And DC was getting swamped by Marvel at the time, getting killed. So he says, let me talk to Uncle Jack. He used to call him Uncle Jack, Leibowitz. He did, and then Leibowitz called me and said, come have lunch with me. And I did, and he said, hey, you know, Urban wants you to be the art director. So I said, yeah, I know about it. And I said, what do you think? I said, well, it's a good idea. It can't hurt. So he said, you don't sound very enthusiastic. I said, look, if you don't give me the work, they wait for me across town, so I really don't care. He gave me the job then. Did you know Erwin Donenfeld that way? Oh, very well. We were close friends. I liked him. We got along very well. Uh, we went away a couple of times, went to Florida a couple of times, and we got along very well. Obviously, you've been an artist for a long time. You did a lot of stories. Did you pay that much attention to the business side of it before you, you developed your relationship yeah, with Erwin? Yeah, yeah. I watched what was going on. I saw in the, some of the things were going on. And Jack, uh, I got to know Jack quite well and Erwin. And Erwin would give me little Phillips at time of this or that. He broke me into understanding how the distributors work. And then I, after I became direct art director, he took me on the road with him, which was very important, you know. And you see how these guys treated comics in those days, you know. They'd strip them as fast as they could, and you had to pay off guys, all kinds of things went on. Sometimes you'd give them uh, three, four hundred books, maybe ten to get out. And they had all kinds of systems you had to break down. One guy, where the hell was he in St. Louis? He was giving all the comics to, say, to the schools over there, and they were putting plaques up on him. We were getting killed with the sales. So we had a big fight with him. We had to get him either that, stop the books, or get out, do something. But I learned from him, which was good. He made me go on the road. It was terrific. And I got to know the men on the road and know how you got to work with them. The, most of the strippers were tough. They couldn't care less. They never liked comics, you know. There was no money in it. They wanted Playboy. That's all they cared about, Playboy. So we got our foot in the door because of Playboy. We connected the same company, distributing. Yeah. Margin's not much on books. No, it wasn't. That's the interesting thing is that most people in this business think about the art, the stories, and all the content and all that stuff. But distribution's key to everything, isn't it? Was it was the whole key. That was the big key. And sometimes the roadmen that we had, you call them and ask them, they didn't know whose books were whose. We'd ask them for a list of our books. They'd say, well, who are you? Which one are you? These are our own roadmen. 
And we had a whole breakdown. So I insisted when I took over then, as I went up the chain, I insisted they come in once a year and I hammered away at them. These are the books, these are what you gotta sell, you gotta push. Right? They didn't like me, but I couldn't care less. <laughs> Who, who put the checkerboards on there? That was a guy named Saul Harrison. It was a bad time to put him on because the books were sinking at that time and Marvel was killing DC. When I saw that, I said, you're burying yourself with this thing. Were you involved in any of the negotiations when Kinney came in and bought No, 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 no. I didn't even know what was going on. I knew something was going on in the office because I could see these guys going back and forth. But then there was a piece in the New York Times which said, Kinney buys Batman. And that was like a trigger. Bob Kane was in with his lawyer, and he owned the character, apparently. So uh, Leibowitz gave him a million bucks for the thing, but a period of 50 years, 50,000 a year for 20 years. But that I had heard about. Jack told me about it. They bought him off that way. Otherwise, the whole deal would have collapsed. Did Erwin call you into his office and say, there's something going on? Yeah, he said, there's something big is going on. Uh, just keep quiet, and if you want to take a vacation for a couple of weeks or something, go it. So I said, no, I'll stay here, I don't care. I don't have to pay attention to what's going on. And then we found out that uh, it was Kinney, but at that time they were called Kinney National. They were a cleaning service, a funeral, the funeral cars. Car parts. Car parts, you know. And also they, uh, there was cash, cash flow, that's what they were looking for, from the distribution, a lot of cash flow, and that's what they were aiming for. Yeah, I heard lots of stories. Oh, you heard about that? Yeah. From him where I was going. Right. I had a friend of mine that worked for. Oh, Kinney then you know. Then you know. When everything kind of settled down, Irwin called you, and what happened? Yeah, I was still the art director, and then Irwin had a big fight with him at Kenny. I don't know what the hell happened, and he quit. He just walked out and quit. And Jack walked in one day and says, "You're running it now," and that was it. Period. It was that simple. And you became published. No, no, I became editor. Then when the guys from Kenny come in, they did a what do you call? What do you call that when they go around and they they check up everyone's job. Yeah, they, uh, they, they, they like, evaluate. Yeah, 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 yeah. And one guy asked me what I did when I gave him a rundown. He says, Jesus Christ, he said, I need about five guys to do that. Then they made me the publisher, and then later on the president of the company. Did you think your responsibility to the company changed at all in terms of what you needed to do? My concerns got heavier, you know, because I had to worry about the bottom line. You know, Before that, I didn't have to worry about the bottom line as editor. I didn't think about it. But then I brought in people I wanted to work with me. I brought in Joe Orlando, Joe Cubitt. I got rid of some people who were kind of laying around like dogs doing nothing. And we kind of revitalized the whole business, you know, we gave it a good shot in the arm. And there's something else I did that I noticed they never did before me. Leibowitz used to always keep his door closed. He'd go in, close that door, nobody would ever see him. So I'd keep my door open, and any artist, any writer, anybody could come in any time they want, sit, bitch, gripe, whatever they want to do, it didn't matter. And it worked. And I also established a coffee room where the, the freelancers could go and talk amongst themselves and look at artwork together. And that helped stimulate things, too. It was a different approach. Uh, what happened to Jack Leibowitz? He's not, he wasn't running it any longer. They just had a sort of a coup one day, and he was gone. They couldn't get rid of him. He's got so much stock in the company. So they gave him an office over in 75 Rock, and he plays Pinochle all day long. He may be still doing it for all I know. He still goes in the he office did, you once say? a month. Yeah. 94, 96. He's an amazing man. I tell you, though, he was very straight. Jack didn't fool. Whatever he, his word was his word, and that was great. You know? And that's something else he taught me. He said, if you promise somebody something, do it, and that's it. John Broom told me a funny story. He said, you know, he tried to get the four or five writers together to band together to say, listen, if we, we don't get a page rate, we're leaving here. You know, we're going right. to stop writing right. for you, and then you're going to have to go find someone. So he got, you know, and it took him like, Months to get everyone to say the same thing. Right. Finally, they got an uh, they got a meeting with Jack Leibowitz. Now Jack had heard about it in right. the meantime, so I had him come in and, and um, two minutes just before he's going to say something. Jack puts up his hand and says, "I want to thank you all for coming here. I just want to let you know the good news. You're getting a page rate." He nailed him. He's he great. Right. Yeah. How tall is he? He's quite tall. Is he's he? quite tall. Yeah, he's a little shorter than I am, but very, very erect. He looks very erect. Very classy looking guy. Yeah. I have a lot of respect for him. I like him. No, and the thing is. He is one of the few guys who's been here since day one. That's right. I mean, he was there when... when I mean, he... I assume that he and Donnefeld are the guys well, that no, took he, was, Malcolm Wheeler. He Smith. was the accountant for, for Donnefeld. Right. He was the accountant. And somehow uh, he, he got into it, and he, then Donnefeld made him the partner because he was doing so well with the books. And then they began buying other properties. But he began as the accountant, not as the owner. Was his brother-in-law to begin with? His brother-in-law was involved in it. Yeah, he was involved, too. I forgot what the hell he did. 
But he and Donnie were the ones that put the thing together. But it's amazing, because the thing is, you know, I mean, he's been around since the days they took right up from Malcolm William yeah. Smith in 1936, 37. Right. And he's still around. So, I mean, he must have, if he can remember it, he must have some great stories. To tell. He should have, but I remember his take on Siegel and Shuster was different than Siegel's. You're never going to get the real story out of these things, no, you know. So. And the thing is, I asked Vin Sullivan, and Vin, you know, he, did he didn't say? say anything. Yeah, well, it's, now he claims he knew it when he saw the strip Superman for the books. He says, when I saw it, I knew immediately. It's not true. It was on the shelf for months. Well, Erwin said he thinks that Shelley is the one who picked it up. Well, I know it was on the shelf, and they had a space in the book. I didn't know what the hell to put in it. So I said, well, what about that thing that those kids brought in, that super thing? And they put it in. But I don't even think they used it on the cover the first time. First issue they put on the cover. Right. But for the first eight or ten issues, they didn't know what was going on. there was almost nothing on there right. until they fi figured out that it was actually the lead feature. Right. And then all of a sudden, this thing is going up and up and up. And what's going on? And they suddenly want, realize what they had. Yeah. And then, of course, they called Kane in for doing the Batman. They want another character. And then they bought out uh, Gaines, I think, a bunch of books, didn't they? They bought All-American comics from well, him? Yeah. I don't know what the relationship between All-American and DC was, but they obviously had... He married them at that point. Yeah. yeah. And I think that they had a relationship even before that. Oh, yeah. yeah House well, ads used to include both books. They were, they were printing most of his stuff, and they were distributing his stuff. Remember, they always had the distribution company going. Independent news. Yeah, always. Yeah. That was the, the money cash cow there. So he was always looking for stuff to put out. And when he saw All American, he picked those up. And then he took a while before he bought Mad. He tried to buy Mad a long time. Then he bought it eventually. You know, he got it. Then the other thing with the union, what he did with Arnold Drake, he was going to represent all the writers. He going to walk in. He wanted to start a union. So they walked in. He was ready for a big fight. Jack didn't fight. He says, I'll tell you what I'll do. Go get uh, Goodman to join. I'll do it right away. And Goodman did the same thing. So he sent him back and forth. It was a joke. <laughs> Once you became publisher, you obviously had a much more involved in a lot of different levels. Did you start dealing with merchandising or films and television, that kind of thing? Yeah, that's when the, these boys come in from uh, from France one day. Salkheim, right? The Salkheim, Salkheim yeah. Salkheim. yeah father and son. And they were interested in Superman. And we discussed the numbers, and we got some pretty good numbers out of them. I think it was half a million up front, seven and a half percent of gross, not net. Guys were crazy. And the boys upstairs didn't even think the movie was going to happen, you know. But these guys were clever. What they did, they buy names to put the movie together. In those days, you had the right names, you get the money for the film. So they got the Puzo, who was pretty hot in those days. And Mario came in and he sat down. I mean, the first story he wrote was about some guys are trying to kill the Pope and Superman saves him. <laughs> That's not a Superman story. What the hell are you guys doing? So I went upstairs, I had a big fight about it. And they sent me out to the coast, and we sat in the Beverly Hills Hotel, and we banged out Superman 1 and 2. E, I, and the Salkins all sat in a big thing on this thing. And that's what came out of it. But it worked well. I was going to say, the first two pictures are the best pictures. Yeah, they were, the rest was junk after that. Mario's brilliant, by the way, and terrific guy. And he's really a terrific guy. And he didn't know anything about the comic book business when he started. Well, no, that's not true. He worked many years ago for Marvel Comics. I found that out later. He told me one day, we were having dinner down at the Polo Lounge, and he told me, he said, yeah, I used to be an editor over there. I was a little shocked. He said, on comics? No, no, he said, on their uh, pulps. They had pulps, too, in those days. So he worked as an editor and a writer on, on their pulps. It's interesting about him. He had he use his name? I mean, his name? Sure, he used his name. And, uh, but he was, he was trying to make a go at that time. He was quite young, you know. So I was shocked about that with him. He was quite a bright guy. Did you extend the merchandising license on the key characters? I, I, I mean, did you make a big push on it at all during the time you were publishing? Sure, we tried. We constantly tried. But that was Jack's nephew that ran that department. Jack gave that whole thing, the licensing, to his nephew, Jay Emmett, you know? So he walked into a gold mine, you know, especially when Batman was on TV. He literally handed it to him. And he started a company with it. And then he eventually sold that company to Warner's and with ours. But we were one. We sold uh, independent news, DC Comics, and licensing corporations, one package to the Kinney Company. Were you there when Kinney became Seven Arts and Seven Arts became Warner? Well, we were working with them when we saw these guys come in very quietly sit down the end there and they're going over the books of Warner Brothers but we didn't know they were buying Warners Leibowitz didn't want it because the picture business was not doing well in those days there was uh, they were making money mostly on TV and films you remember the films were in bed and, and dump it but Ross insisted on it. he had uh, I forgot who he had in his corner 
And uh, and Jack was going to go down and said, no good, we're not going to do it, but they, they, viewed him, they voted him out, you know. Then right after that, I think Jack was giving him an awful lot of trouble, and he was pushed out of D.C. And we walked in one day, and he was out. They brought a guy named Mark Iglesias in to replace him. They moved fast in those days. And then Mark himself was replaced a little later on, by the way. They unloaded him. Things had kind of been status quo for a long, long time right. there until, it got, until new management came in. Did things change? Did things change? What they tried to do when we first signed, they were going to put a time clock in for the artists and the, and the people in the bullpen. I said, you're crazy. This is not kind of a business. We don't sell funeral parlors here. So we talked them out of it, you know. But they didn't want to work that way. But they didn't do it, you know. So they didn't equate the fact that they were a movie company with talent with a comic book company. They had no use for the comics. Did they think that they were at least creating entities that could be used no. as a resource? No. Ross himself, with all his knowledge, because he claimed later he bought it because of Batman, he hated the comics. One time, one of the people who said when we moved to 75 Rock said they had space in the window downstairs at 75 Rock. We'd like to put some of our licensed product in the window. For sure, we don't mind. He came by in his car and he saw this and he was screaming, get that garbage out of my window, I don't want... This is the guy who alleges he loved comics, you know, it was a lot of crap. So basically he didn't want to see... He didn't know what he had what he there. Thought. It was crummy stuff. No, he bought the company for the distribution with the cash cow, the, a lot of cash flow going on. Trolla Magazine distribution is a big business. That's it right. It certainly was in the 50s. And yeah, I think that's dying now. I think it's gone. I look at Playboy, went from 7 million, I think, at that time. Was it 350,000 now? If that. And the comics are dying, too. We talked about that, you know, what we both think. I think the glory days are over. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, over the course of the last 10 or 15 years, the, a lot of the American comics have started to mimic the European comics, which yeah. are still popular. Oh, yeah, I know. But it's a whole different world over there. Yeah, and they also sell at a higher price point. Yeah, but I also noticed that whatever was hot here was not so in Europe, you know. For some reason, I could never figure that out. This, well, my theory is the fact that um, in the United States, they pick a hero or right. a character and that all of the stuff is built around that character right. and in Europe they pick a story and they build around that story right. and either one book or three books is devoted to that story and that was it and the character may end up becoming an integral part of the story but that's what they sell right. not the character right. and all in the, all the US stuff is character driven yeah and themes like westerns were always big in Europe it didn't work here we couldn't right. sell it here Tarzan did sensational in Europe when we took it over, it didn't do that well for us. You know? we, we, were, we were buying that for the European market because we own the overseas stuff too. They're very interested in history, historical yeah. Yeah. subject, and nothing like that's going to sell. Sure. Right no, here. I mean, no. you know, Brave and Bold started out with Robin Hood and Silent Night still yeah. doing anything. That's right. Until, until you started doing Justice League or some kind of, you know, and they hard out. Right. Why did you leave DC? We had a big argument the year before I was there. We made about a million bucks. We're doing that's just publishing. We did pretty well. The next year, Marvel Comics had decided they were going to push us off the stands. This was something that we did to Dell many years ago, and you do it by flooding. You really flood away, and it can't push the other guy off. So as you put in, he retreats, takes books off. Well, I wouldn't do it. Every book he put, I, I matched them book for book. It cost us both a lot of money. So when they called us in, I think we had lost about a million bucks. They had lost about a million and a half, and they wanted to know why. And I told them. They says, well, we don't agree with the theory. They said, what do you think we should have done? They said, we should, you should have just kept backing off. I said, we would have been dead. We'd be off the shelf. Well, that's your, that's your opinion. And he says, well, I think it's best <laughs> we end the situation now. And that was it. Did you ever look at the sales figures during the time that you were published? Always. I had them every week. I got them in. From and the did account. you feel a good uh, sense of satisfaction that you'd done the best job possible? Ever? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I was happy with what I'd done. Well, you get them in periods. You know, you get the first month and you get six months, and you get a year later. That's when your final numbers come in. But you could be living off a number you think is so great about the third month, and you find out it was a dog at the end. It's a very tough business, but you gotta write it out. Write them out, you gotta try. Did your relationship change with either the editors, writers, or artists that I, you had? I don't think so, because I'm still friends with some of the boys. Orlando till he died. Cuban, we're still very close. Uh, some of the artists, Nick Carty. We're still very close. No, we're still close. You were a publisher. You're obviously, your responsibilities and your position They changed, changed. But still, we were friendly. I mean, the boys had always an open door to walk in and talk and kid around. We always, I always had that. We never let go of that. 
I think that was important. I felt it was important to have this community thing with us, you know. Does Julie still tell the same stories today? Oh, God Years help ago? us. God help us. <laughs> yeah, he was not fun to work with. He was not fun at all, you know. And he was strictly a, a company guy. Or Julie lived for Julie. As I said, you bring a job and instead of patting the guy on the head and say, gee, that's great. You got paid, didn't you? And then that was it. Well, the problem, I'm sure he had favorites. I mean, he, I'm, there's still he's got favorites. And the point is that, that you know, you're not even going to overcome that. Which, Ultimately, your work is judged on how good it was from artistic merit and how well it sold in right. the commercial world. And I think that at a certain point, you probably just have to be able to, to live with the fact that some guys are hard to get along with. Yeah, you well, like I did. You did and you yeah. did a good job and it sold well. You did a good job. Yeah, I didn't pay much attention to what he said. Uh, you know, but many guys got upset. Quite a few got upset. You know, they're sensitive to this stuff. Well, you and, worked for him for a long time. Yeah, but he didn't bother me. I couldn't have cared less, you know. In fact, if he got on my nerves, I took off into the trip. We go away for a couple of months. Well, he obviously liked your work. He kept giving it to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I was his mainstay for years. Yeah, I was going to say you did the Flash. Did I, in fact, I was with him for yeah. about thirty years as an artist. You know, Flash, Adam Strange, all the romance, Western, whatever. I did some work for Canada too. You know, he's tougher to work for, but he was uh, much more creative. I thought. In terms of story. Yeah. Yeah, he was sharp. He was very sharp. Julie would really, when he edited a, a story from an editor, he'd write it to death, you know. And he almost, he was predictable. You read his scripts, you knew read one, you read ten, and they're all pretty much the same. You know? I hear Kanega was one of the best writers. In the I day. think so. And most creative, one of the most creative guys. He created characters for that company, boy, it was unbelievable. He did uh, all of the war books for, for That's right. Kanega created every character that was in there. Yeah, and then he did the, the Metal Man. It was a great idea. He created Enemy Ace. Terrific guy. This guy was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And he created The Flesh. I know there's lots of stories going around about who. But all I remember going in for a job, and Julie said, we're going to be doing superheroes again. And I said, oh, my God. And I wasn't thrilled about the idea. But he says, Bob did the script, and he gave me the, his script. And Bob even laid out the very first cover, what he wanted. You know? So that I know is fact, because I was there. And that was the kickoff of all the superheroes that went after. I remember Kubert inked your job down there. That's right. Now, how many times did Joe Kubert ink jobs for you? Uh, after that, on my work, about two years before, we did a job for St. John. It was called Jesse James. I penciled it in one day, the whole book. And when I told him about it, he said, I can do it in a day. I said, I don't think so, Joe. He did. He, he didn't even put borders on the damn thing. <laughs> it was very funny. But that was the other thing. Did you guys ever get in a competitive situation like that with any of the people you work with and saying, I can do this kind of stuff? I think we respected each other, you know? There was not that kind of competition, you know? We all wanted to do better. But uh, we still liked each other. We socialized, we horsed around together. It was fun. We had fun times. I enjoyed it. And we still get together now and again. Huh? I have lunch with him now, every once in a while. He comes into town. Did you work with Mike Sikowski ever? Yeah, I knew Mike quite well. He made him an editor at one point on Wonder Woman. And uh, he was a tough cookie to work with. A strange man. His wife, many years ago, took off with his two daughters. He never got over that. And he drank like a bandit. He was and fast. It, yeah, oh, he was brilliant. He could imitate Kirby better than Kirby. He was that good, yeah. Did he work for, for Joe and Jeff? He worked for them for quite a few years. Did you work for St. John on a regular basis or just every once in a while? No, just once in a while. Cuba did the work for He did the 3D books with them. You remember those 3D yeah, he books? Did tour, he did tour. Uh, yeah, and he, he's, but he owns that. So That's his. Sinbad? Right, right. Joe was prolific. He's terrific. A lot of respect for Joseph. Now, he's still working. You ever think about drawing? No, I don't want to do it anymore. Why? No, I've said all I could say with the drawing. I really have nothing more to say. But, I mean, do you, you draw for yourself? I don't mean publish. No. No, I don't draw at all. In fact, if somebody, or I have to do a recreation now and again, it takes a long time to sit down and do it. I just don't enjoy it anymore. Really? Yeah, I, it's a thing I have. But, I mean, you never painted or did watercolors or anything? I did watercolors as a kid. Oh, I did watercolors, but sure. nothing is in the... Design. No, no, nothing commercial. No, I have a, I have a couple at home. I did. But other than that, no. And to this day, I have none of my work on the walls at home. Nothing. Do you think being publisher kind of phased you out of that in your business? I think so. I think so. Or I think I just had it. You know, there's a water mark you reach and you feel, that's it. I can't do more with this. You know? And that's what happened with me. I didn't feel I had much more to say with the pencil. And then why keep it redundant? I couldn't do it. I said, that was it. I'm not unhappy about it either. I got more important things to do now. <laughs> Go to a gym. <laughs> you got any favorite re remembrances of the, of the comics? I mean, obviously, you were in the business for a long time. Yeah. You started as a very, young, very yeah. young guy. I mean, sure. you know, 
literally in your in your mid teens. There must be something in terms of the overall business that you got. It was a lonely business. It's a very lonely business. You work all alone for hours on end, and you get strange machinations in your head because you think about the world outside. You're really not a part of it, you know. And your world is that fantasy world you're creating on paper, you know. And then once a week you deliver this stuff, and he'd say thank you, goodbye, and good luck, go back home again. It was a tough work, a tough way to make a living. I felt still is, I think. Very solitary, right? Oh, it's a roughie.